It is springtime in Chicago, a season where many flowers and trees are in full bloom. To the naked eye, these plants grow effortlessly, but the way in which they get energy from the sun is a pretty complex process, taking nature millions of years to perfect. A new study out of the University of Chicago found a fascinating link between photosynthesis and the supercooling of atoms, comparing it to finding ice cubes forming in a hot cup of coffee. Here, the authors explain how they discovered that link and what this new possibility could mean for the future of how we power our homes and cities. I'm David Mazziotti, a professor at the University of Chicago in the Department of Chemistry and the James Franck Institute. And our research group got interested in thinking about uh, both photosynthetic light harvesting and also exciton condensation. And so um, basically, uh, Anna Shouten and Leanne Sanger-Smith are two graduate students in my research group and collectively the three of us uh, basically worked on the problem and came up with a study that, that we presented in PRX Energy. I'm Anna Scouten. Um, I mentioned I'm a PhD student in the group. I'm, I'm the first author on the paper um, and a, a lot of what I've been doing in research is looking at exciton condensation. Hi, um, I'm Leanne Sager-Smith. I'm a fifth year graduate student in the Maziati group. And I'm, I, I've am i been working on exon condensation since the first summer I was here in 2018. But on this specific paper, um, Anna didn't really promote herself, but she's really the person that did almost all of the work on this paper. I was more of a supplemental role. Um, and so she should take the credit where it's well-deserved. What sort of led to uh, Anna's study, and maybe Anna can talk a little bit more about this, is, well, is there an aspect, because we all often, you know, we know that basically photosynthesis is occurring all around us. This particular time of year is a good time of year for thinking about it. All the trees are coming out in the last couple of months in Chicago. And we know that nature has a way of being extremely efficient in harvesting energy from the sun. And we were thinking, well, is there any connection between how basically photosynthesis works in terms of processing energy from the sun, because we know it creates excitons also. Is there any role of exciton condensation in this phenomenon that occurs at room temperature in photosynthesis? And this is what we framed as the question. And then Anna's work helped bring some new insight into this, into the situation. We were looking at kind of photosynthesis and starting from the idea that in photosynthesis, the energy comes in from the sunlight hitting hitting the plant. And what that does is it kind of changes the state of the electrons that are already in the plant and shifts them up in energy so that then the electron can kind of bind with the hole, which is what's kind of left over when the electron moves and that forms an exciton. And then those excitons created from the sunlight coming in is then how energy is transferred through photosynthesis from the sun to eventually the part of the plant where they use the energy to, you know, carry out any processes like growing flowers or sending out roots, whatever the plant needs to do. Um, and, and so this kind of is interesting and something that people have looked a lot at in terms of trying to make more efficient systems for transporting energy because the energy transfer yield in photosynthesis is unusually high. That typically a synthetic system like something that is made in the lab doesn't transfer energy as efficiently as this kind of natural system where nature has spent, you know, millions of years developing the best way to transfer energy. Um, and, and so what was interesting is then looking at was there a way to tie this kind of really efficient transfer that's already present in nature that takes place under very normal conditions in systems that don't have to be like specially cooled down or put under pressure and exciton condensation where typically the systems do require like really cold temperatures or a lot of pressure these highly ordered systems in order to get this perfectly efficient energy transfer and, and what we ended up seeing when we looked into this is that there's um, 
kind of a limited sort of exciton condensation where we're not fully seeing total exciton condensation, but we're kind of seeing like a limited or a pocket of exciton condensation that helps increase the efficiency overall um, to about du double in some cases what we would expect to see otherwise. So the hope basically is that we can take this from nature and kind of learn some lessons from nature about how do we translate this into essentially better materials that can actually impact our everyday lives. And part of it was really, I mean, I think the way you described it's really well, we're thinking about, well, nature's, you know, nature is doing this at room temperature because nature has to do it at room temperature. It can't cool things down to, to low temperatures. And so what's fascinating is that nature's figured out how, how can, how can nature use how can nature use some of the aspects of exciton condensation that occur in these ideal cold materials, but at room temperature? And kind of what we see in our study, which is very tantalizing and exciting, is that nature seems to do it by creating local exciton condensations, these patches of exciton condensation. And so even actually having just a few exitons go into a kind of a, a single quantum state locally, and then having that locally occur somewhere else can actually increase the efficiency significantly. And that's, I think that's a design principle then that we can potentially try to exploit as we build better synthetic materials. I, I would say when, one of the big things like we talked about is the possibility of applying this in other technologies in the future that uh, obviously what, what we've done here doesn't directly tell people how this is going to impact, you know, how energy is used in their homes. Um, but it, it does present a possibility for something that then someone else could go and do that work to look at saying, how do we apply this to make people's lives better in a real way? Yeah, and I would say science is for everyone too, to some extent, you know, so, you know, we've all had those moments where you're kind of curious, how does something work, you know, and it's kind of cool when you sort of figure out how does this, you know, how does this happen? And so, you know, I think our role as scientists as well, you know, one of the reasons why we were kind of keen to have a press release about the work as well is that we feel like there's a responsibility to kind of communicate some of our stuff just beyond just the journal to say, oh, you know, this, these are the aspects of the research that are interesting for everyone to kind of have a sense of how how this works. And so, you know, I kind of hope that people can find excitement just in, you know, everyone gets excited about summer time and, you know, being outdoors. And I think just being able to appreciate even more how remarkable some of the things are that surround us, that we take for granted, you know, that we see it every day, but just to realize that there's a lot actually happening, even at the molecular level, to make, you know, to make basically the world go around. We, as humans, have been trying to make energy for for ages. I mean, that's what the combustion engine is. That's what um, solar electric cells are. And a, a big thing that scientists take inspiration from is nature, because nature has been doing this for hundreds and thousands and millions of years. And just from, from, from evolution over time has gotten very, very good at it. And so shedding some light on the mechanism that nature gets energy and transfers to energy, um, I, I find to be very exciting just as a step. It's, it's a very small step, but it's a step in the process of understanding how, how nature goes about doing things. Also, one thing that's really important, I think, in terms of just science education is that oftentimes, you know, we tend to compartmentalize things and we think, well, you know, if I'm interested in photosynthesis, you know, why do I need quantum mechanics or why do I need physics, you know? And so I, I hope that the study also can kind of help people see that, well, everything's kind of connected. And sometimes we don't know what the connections are going to be until, until we sort of bring things that don't seem to be connected together. And in this case, you know, basically using a bit of quantum mechanics to see that the excitons can develop this long range order um, in the system. Um, and they basically, the excitons kind of become, they, they have a certain synchronicity. So like if you have like synchronous swimming, for example, you can think of all the swimmers, you know, swimming in a synchronous motion. Uh, what happens with quantum mechanics is that all the excitons, kind of like a bunch of bells all ringing at the same time in resonance, 
you get all the excitons kind of line up and they all start to transfer energy kind of like the synchronous swimmers. And so they can do it much more efficiently because they're working in concert. And so, you know, it's an example where we see how quantum mechanics has the ability to do some things that are a little bit foreign from our, our perspective on the, on the macroscopic world where the laws are all classical mechanics. But um, yeah, it's really, it's really neat to see that, you know, nature, photosynthesis, the trees around us, are actually borrowing from the laws that actually govern, you know, just electrons and small particles, still adds up to be to creating more efficiency for macroscopic objects too. So I don't know, there's a lot there, but I think, you know, ultimately the hope is that people can see, wow, it's, there's really exciting aspects of like quantum mechanics seems like something in the domain of Einstein, but you know, it's really something that can be important every day as well, actually, um, even if it's a little bit invisible to the naked eye.